Rob. Thanks, everybody. Um, I'm a little bit ill right now, so I'd like to apologize to the citizens of Alberta for bringing out something for your pleasure. Uh, sorry. Um, I, I'm, I'm, no, I, I can stand. Um, I want to acknowledge first the people that actually did the work here. Uh, I'm just a spokesperson for this particular project. I want to single out uh, my collaborator from Keanu College in Fort McMurray. That's Dr. Dana Schock. She's done a lot of work in the last several years on this project, including spending all of her summers in the field uh, looking at amphibians and looking at the health of the, of, the, of the ecosystems where those amphibians live. So what we're addressing in this project is a JAWSM objective of establishing, using wood frogs, a sentinel species approach uh, to use that species to monitor the health of ecosystems and to generate data on change in the, in the ecosystem and effects on, on potential receptors in the ecosystem uh, by knowing what's going on with that sentinel species. I should mention there's a poster up. It's a little late notice now, though. There's a poster up in the poster room if you want to discuss any of this in more detail. Uh, and finally, I just before moving on, I just want to acknowledge the other people that have helped us out here, in particular Parks Canada, who's uh, helping us out in northern sites and in the Northwest Territories, uh, Government of Northwest Territories as well, and Wabia has been helpful in, in uh, um, developing and establishing this project. Um, I'm, I'm going to just go through real quickly what we're, what we're trying to do with this project and why. Um, we're looking at the, the health of wood frogs and their habitat, so where they live, and varying distances from oil sands uh, operations, from disturbances. Um, we're using the wood frogs themselves uh, to determine appropriate measures, uh, using, looking at individual health of the animals, for instance, development and deformities, uh, developmental abnormalities, and stress response in those animals. We're looking at disease as well. And what we're trying to establish is whether or not we can use these endpoints in frogs living in the situation to do long-term monitoring and assess change in the, in the ecosystem. Why frogs? They're very good. Uh, wood frogs are very good species to use as a, as the, in the sentinel species approach. They're widely distributed in the region. We know a lot about them. They have both aquatic and terrestrial phases to their life cycle, of course, so we can look at both aquatic and terrestrial effects. And we assume, or we're, we're trying to show, that we can uh, use the health of frogs to uh, indicate the health of the greater ecosystem. We're also doing the effects-based measures that have to be done to establish this as a monitoring uh, system. So we're doing laboratory studies as well. And because uh, wood frogs are well known in the lab and we've done a lot of work with them, uh, they're good species to use for lab exposure type of studies. What I'm going to be talking about today is basically the exposure end of things, uh, what we're establishing in terms of wildlife contaminants and, uh, and uh, exposure of the wildlife in the oil sands region. So where we're working, uh, and you can't see that at all, but it's um, a number of ponds that have been developed and, and, and visited over the, uh, the period that Dr. Schock has been working out in, in Fort McMurray. These have been selected through various, uh, various means, and now, now they are our core study ponds. Uh, at those ponds, uh, we examine frogs when we can catch them, tadpoles, for the presence of deformities and other indications of poor health. Tissue samples, so we do collect frogs. We take those uh, frogs back to the lab. We, uh, we look at tissues for uh, contaminants and for disease presence in these animals. And, uh, and as I mentioned, the stress hormones. Water samples are also collected at these ponds uh, for general water quality uh, and for contaminants. And then finally, as I mentioned, we bring some um, samples back and we do toxicity testing in the lab. And we do some other things uh, related to the exposure end of the equation, the risk assessment equation uh, in the lab with samples we're bringing back from the field. I just want to go into a little bit more detail about what we're, what we're doing and, and what we're collecting. And again, this is on the exposure end of things. So in the water, we're looking at multiple time points, so multiple collections over the breeding season of these frogs to get any kind of annual variation in contaminant levels in the breeding ponds. Um, and we do basic water quality uh, information on those samples. We're also looking at, at the, the contaminants of concern in, the, in those water samples, for instance, metals. Uh, polyaromatic hydrocarbons and naphthenic acids. 
We're all deploying semi-permeable membrane devices, and I'm going to get uh, into this later in the talk. Um, those go out for about a month. Uh, they go out into the breeding sites where we have wood frogs breeding. We bring those back and we send those, those uh, SPMDs out for analysis at a commercial lab for PAHs. The reason we're doing that, and I'll talk about it later, as I said, is that we're hoping that we can use these SPMDs, these passive monitoring devices, as surrogates for wood frog tadpoles. If they function the same as a wood frog tadpole, we don't need to collect a tadpole. That's the goal for that particular part of the study. We're, we've done some coring of our wetlands uh, to look at historical pH and contamination. And we collect sediment, bring that back, both for the contaminants in that sediment and also to use that sediment for our uptake, our toxicity uh, studies. In terms of the, uh, the amphibians, um, so we, we find wood frog tadpoles uh, in our study sites. Those are why they are our study sites. There's wood frogs in them. We collect uh, or examine wood frog tadpoles, recent metamorphs, those are the guys that have just gone through metamorphosis and have just are leaving the ponds, and adults. We analyze these separately for contaminants. Um, as I mentioned, uh, looking at deformities and disease, particularly ranavirus, which is an important disease of amphibians in North America, causes mass uh, mortality events. And then, again, uh, we look at corticosterone for stress hormone levels in those animals. We send the, most of the uh, samples out uh, to commercial labs, uh, those that we can't analyze ourselves uh, at my, uh, my lab, which is the National Wildlife Research Center. Uh, and I just wanted to sort of mention that this is very, very labor intensive, very time consuming and very difficult uh, field work. And it's a credit to Dr. Schock who runs teams of uh, field crews out of uh, Keanu College. Uh, to basically go out and find frogs. Uh, the recent metamorphs take a lot of time to find, so it's very, very, very uh, involved field work and take, takes all, all summer to do, basically. Just going through some of the, some of the data that we have, and the, the, I'm only showing a bit of data on some of the uh, compounds that are coming out of the ICPMS, and I'll get into mercury as well, uh, and where we have we, are, we have an ability to match those data up against uh, CCME guidelines for the protection of freshwater aquatic life. So uh, just for a couple of examples, we've got arsenic and cadmium in the wetlands, in the water, below levels at this point that uh, are um, going to trigger any guidelines for, for CCME. Uh, it's the same with lead and selenium, uh, low levels and below the CCME um, CCME guidelines. So these are just examples of the kind of gen uh, data that we're generating from the individual wetlands themselves. Mercury is uh, a little bit different. We're getting some hits on mercury. Um, we don't see uh, spatial patterns with respect to distance from the upgraders, so that's something that uh, we find interesting. Uh, we also um, are not seeing any kind of consistent temporal variation uh, uh, within the year, so there's no sort of variation within the sampling season. Um, and again, um, mercury is, uh, is currently below CCME guidelines uh, for the protection of, of, in the water for the protection of a, uh, freshwater aquatic life. We've got uh, data on mercury and wood frog tissues, and as I mentioned, we've analyzed uh, these separately. Um, uh, as, as you can see in the, in the pictures, tadpoles, Recent metamorphs, you probably, yeah, you probably cannot see that frog there. It's just a, a recently metamorphosed frog. Still has a bit of a tail on it, but it does have all four limbs, so it's a, it's a metamorph. And then the adults uh, in the bag at the bottom. Um, we, ha we have seen, as I mentioned, we have seen some hits on mercury. Um, we, we're still looking at these data. We want to figure out one of the things that we need to do is really figure out what's going on in these ponds and why there might be a particular pond where we're seeing an elevated level of mercury. Um, so still uh, diving into these data quite, quite uh, intensively. Um, I did want to mention, though, that one of the things that we did find interesting, because we had these individual life stages and we analyzed them separately, is that consistently... Um, the tadpoles showed higher levels of mercury, and it was statistically significant compared to the adults. The tadpoles showed higher levels of, uh, of mercury. Now, there's probably physiological uh, reasons for that. There's uh, immense restructuring of the, of the tadpole to go through metamorphosis and, and turn into an adult. Um, nevertheless, it's, I think it's invaluable and inf interesting information for us because 
if we are going to continue to do this and we want to use these species to monitor, for instance, mercury in these wetlands, we can then say probably we can only, we can concentrate on collecting tadpoles. And which is nice because as I mentioned, finding the metamorphs in the adults is a significant task and tadpoles are a little bit more uh, amenable to, to doing this work with. With this respect to some of the other uh, things that are coming out of the ICPMS, it's the, it's the same um, with most of the other metals we're looking at, uh, except for selenium. So again, this kind of emphasizes that it's good, it's, this is good data because we can focus, I think, on tadpoles as the, you know, as the life stage of interest for, the, for this uh, particular monitoring. We are also doing work with PAHs, uh, and um, up here I've just got a couple, again, a couple of examples of uh, um, what we're dealing with, and this is naphthalene and anthracene, and those are, you know, again, they have some guidelines established for them. And we're seeing low levels of uh, PAHs in the wetlands, and we're not seeing any sort of real discernible uh, spatial patterns in those. Uh, total, and this is sort of emphasized in the total PAHs in the wetlands. Uh, so again, no discernible pattern uh, with respect to distance from upgraders. These are grab samples out of the water um, and no consistent uh, temporal variation observed within the years. We were, um, thanks to some collaboration with Parks Canada, we're also looking at uh, other sites up in, the, up in the north. So around Fort Smith and Fort Resolution, we've got some samples and we're comparing this, the, uh, the contaminant levels in those, uh, at those sites with the uh, sites closer to uh, closer to Fort McMurray. Now, pHs are interested, interesting, and we really want to get a good handle on what's happening with pH contamination in these wetlands. So we did enter this, uh, in, into this project uh, with collaborators at the University of Ottawa, where we're use, utilizing these SPMDs, uh, passive monitoring devices, to sample pHs, uh, monitor pHs in these wetlands that we're working in. Uh, it's a pretty simple, uh, simple concept. They are like freezies, basically. These, these, uh, there's thin, thin film, thin film strips uh, with an agent inside that that will um, sequester PAHs. So you deploy them into the wetlands and you leave them out there for about a month. And you, and you, what we're trying to do is compare the pH levels that are sequestered in those passive samplers with what we see in the tadpoles at that same site. So an ideal deployment of these, uh, of these SPMDs is in a pond close to where you have egg masses because the, the growth and development period of, the, of those, the embryos that hatch out of those eggs, the tadpoles, about a month long, you leave the SPMDs out for about a month and then you compare the two things. The, the, the deployment you can see here, unfortunately you probably can't see, but this one's got about six uh, full egg masses around it. So that's kind of a perfect deployment because we can, we're in a situation then where those tadpoles are gonna develop around that SPMD and then we can compare the two burdens of pHs in those eventually. Um, these are study sites. So these are sites where we both deployed SPMDs and uh, collected tadpoles for comparison of the SPMD levels and the tadpole levels. And then just some of the results. So, the, the, the SPMDs go out to uh, commercial lab and they give us 76, I think it is, pH congeners coming back. First thing that we noticed when we started to get the data back was that we're not seeing parent pH compounds. We're seeing mostly alkylated pHs, which is good information in, in, in its own right. It might help us with our analytical burden if we can actually don't bother to look at the parent pHs. So predominantly accumulating uh, the alkylated uh, pHs in, from all of the sites in these SPMDs. A comparison of uh, the pH, uh, the SPMDs going out uh, in two years, which was another thing that we just got recently. So we put them out in the same ponds two years in a row. And they, they performed quite consistently over the two years. And that's really valuable to us as well. We want to make sure that these things would perform consistently on an annual basis if we're going to be using them uh, in any kind of a long-term monitoring sense. And both of these plots just say the same thing, is that when you put them in the same pond uh, two years in a row, they, they basically uh, sequester the same, the same profile of pHs. 
Uh, and then they're also useful, uh, we found, in, ter in terms of picking up pHs in relation to distance from upgraders. So this is different from just the water grab samples. In these guys, in these SPMDs, we can see a discernible pattern uh, and the SPMDs that are, or the, sorry, the PAHs that are sequestered in these SPMDs versus the distance from an upgrader. Uh, and this is basically um, showing on the, on the plot um, what, the, what the basic concentration are in, of, of the, at the different sites of the, of the PAHs and the SPMDs. Gateway Pond, some of you may know Gateway Pond. It's not included in this analysis because it's an odd pond. It's got overburden in it, and we didn't want to include it because it might confound the analysis. And then, so finally, this is, the, this is the final slide, almost the final slide. We compared uh, in the laboratory um, what we're seeing in the SPMDs and what we're seeing in actual tadpoles, uh, wood frog tadpoles that we're using in our, in our uh, exposure and effects experiments. So the way, the way that we did this was we took sediment, as you can see uh, in that photo in the, in the top, we took sediment, we brought it back to Ottawa, we put that sediment in the bottom of Aquaria, we, filled the, uh, we covered that sediment uh, with water, and then we put wood frog tadpoles in on, on top of that, uh, into that water. And one of the first things we noticed was that uh, within six hours of being put into that situation over that sediment that we brought back from, from uh, Fort McMurray, uh, within six hours we could detect PAHs in those tadpoles. The other interesting thing that uh, we see from this is that uh, the, the tadpoles are accumulating the same type of profile as the SPMDs are. Uh, so they are accumulating alkylated PAHs uh, in this sort of controlled laboratory exposure situation, which again is another very nice thing to, to know because then it further validates, I think, uh, uh, the use of SPMDs instead of uh, tadpoles for monitoring pHs in these wetlands. So just in summary, uh, as I mentioned, we saw no strong patterns in wetland contaminants in space or time, the stuff that's coming off our, our, uh, our ICPMS runs. Uh, for all metals measured, um, most were well below uh, CCME uh, guidelines, and this, it was a similar situation with the pHs. They're at, at low levels currently in our study wetlands. We did see differences in, these, in the body burdens of, these, uh, of the uh, mercury uh, in, and other metals in, uh, in those uh, tadpoles versus metamorphs and versus uh, adults, uh, which is, is nice data to have. And then finally, we, we, were see, we are saying now, I think we can say that these SPMDs uh, are a nice um, way to monitor pHs in wetlands without having to sacrifice kill tadpoles. And because uh, they can both distinguish uh, more or less contaminated sites and accumulate a tadpole-like pH profile, which is, was kind of confirmed in the, uh, the laboratory exposures. We have uh, plans, certainly, to be back out uh, in these study wetlands in 2015, uh, probably with a slightly reduced uh, program uh, going down to a core of about seven ponds where we will intensively study them, continue to characterize them, and uh, deploy SPMDs uh, and collect tadpoles to further look at this uh, relationship between the SPMD type of passive monitor and the tadpoles. And general, you know, collect water samples, continue to do that to further characterize the contaminant profiles in these wetlands. And again, collect sediment for both um, looking at the contaminants in the sediment and bringing that sediment back to, to at least two labs to do further um, exposure and effects uh, laboratory experiments. And with that, I'd like to thank you for your attention. and. Uh, and just uh, another thanks to field crews that have to do all of the all of the laborious field work in this uh, for this study. Thanks. Right, we have a minute or two for questions. I see a, a couple coming over to this microphone, so we'll do those two. Hi, really great presentation. Right. Um, might be just trying to expand on it. Um, sorry, Mandy Demansky with the Alberta Energy Regulator. So when we're reviewing monitoring programs or things like this that are going to look at wildlife endpoints, I'm just wondering where you get your stats guidance from, what your go-to is, how you, on that one side, set a potential outlier. 
when we're dealing with impacted or contaminated sites, is this an outlier or is this a hot spot? There's a lot of controversy around that using, you know, validated stat statistical methods. Trend analysis right now is really up in question in the methods we should be using. So if you can just expand on it and speak to that, that'd be great. Thanks. Yeah, well I think, I mean, and, and to be honest, I'm, I'm thinking of that particular outlier we're talking about. One of the things that we've, we've found very challenging in this situation is to, to, to try to make sure that the ponds that we're studying are matched, are not really, really varied in terms of their characteristics, and that's an incredible challenge. And when we, when we are sampling, and per, particularly with the late, the late stage sampling, like later in the year, these ponds typically are starting to dry up, right? They can be dry up. These are ephemeral, a lot of these are ephemeral ponds that we're working in. And we have concerns that we're, you know, that we could be picking up sediment when we're trying to get water out of a, out of a you know, a, a small, and if we're not treating those samples in a manner appropriate to just say that's, that's water column contamination and stuff like that. That's why I think it's not, in, the, in this case, it's we are, and I think I said that we're trying to dive into the data to make sure that we're happy with that result, right? And it's not a statistical approach, basically. It's to look at everything else, all of the information we have for that particular pond before we make a conclusion that we're really comfortable with this particular result. <laughs> Yeah, that's, I think, what I'm trying to allude to is yeah. on these site-specific studies where we're trying to generate toxicity data for species, then we're using that data and we're trying to evaluate monitoring programs that are being um, submitted to us. And we don't have that go-to because we have these smaller scale. We're not incorporating maybe the regional, like what's going on, what's happening seasonally, yep. and yep. these will define maybe um, seasonally specific endpoints that you need to monitor because that could be the drivers, that type of thing. So I'm just yep. wondering if you thought about how we can incorporate it all or if Environment Canada started kind of moving towards that. Well, yeah. <laughs> I know, really big question. <laughs> yeah, no, I would hope so. And I think that's one of the reasons. I mean, it, it's, it, it is. We are trying to do a regional approach and trying to get, for instance, for mercury, trying to establish a full story on mercury and we need to understand. We've got some, for instance, methylmercury data uh, out of these ponds, uh, out of these tissues as well. And we need to know about the cycling of mercury. We need to know how to, basically, it, 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 it's going to take, I think, an integrated effort on a large scale, right, to understand what's going on in these ponds. We need more aquatic ecologists, right? What, what's going on in these ponds and how we can develop a database of sort of the, the whole, the contaminant situation in the entire area. And we're doing a little part, basically, but we need to, I mean, we need to look at the whole picture, right? And, and, I, and that's not a useful answer, but it's a dream. It. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. Right. Thank you. Uh, two much simpler questions. Uh, mercury and lead in the tadpoles. Yep. So if we look at the data for the Athabasca River from the State of the Watershed Report Phase 3, Town of Athabasca, seasonal variation, 2007 to 2012, mercury data follows dissolved organic carbon very nicely. So it right. looks like the water is the humic materials in the water are dominating the mercury story. So my question is for the tadpoles, do you consider the DOC and how? And then your lead data, a part per million of lead is really high. Right. So my question is the particulate, the colloidal material, so how do you consider that? Are there some other metals that you're also measuring, like non-calcophile metals, like lithophile metals, aluminum, titanium, whatever, yeah. to correct the lead value? Yes. Yeah, we are. I mean, well, we've got a, so com relative to the talk yesterday, we have a more limited ICPMS uh, run, which is 24 elements of aluminum is in there. The other thing that, uh, that we've c had to consider, and we've done this with the PH, is, is um, for instance, with uh, tadpoles, we might want to take out the GI tract before we, before we analyze um, to, to make sure that there's no particulate matter. Essentially, these guys are on the, you know, on the sediment sucking stuff up. We want to make sure that, they're, you know. So I think it's, it's and, and we have not done a lot of DOC characterization of these wetlands, and that's another thing that has to be done. The full characterization of these wetlands and the fact that we can compare you know, it's like the Birch Mountain situation, right, where, where we're thinking, they're, you know, and some of them are on bitumen, obviously, um, 
the full characterization of these ponds, I think, has to be done to help us understand or interpret the data that we're getting out of, out of the tadpoles, for instance. Yeah, and I agree, yeah. Uh, one more question over here. Hi, Bill Donahue, Environmental, uh, Alberta Environmental <coughs> Network, and I'm on the Water Component Advisory Committee. Uh, I'm not sure if I missed it or not, and this speaks more to the wetland health aspect of this, but are you assessing uh, population metrics as well to... Yes. Okay. Yeah, what we're trying to do, I mean, in, in, I guess in a limited fashion, we're trying to do the population, the metapopulation of that area. And w with a, it's also sort of biased because we work in ponds where we have wood frogs. We have, we have to. What we haven't been doing, and, and, and this has always been a consideration, is we should be working in wetlands that have adequate habitat that should have uh, wood frogs in them. Uh, to, to, to try to determine why they're not there. So population on the landscape, yeah, we're certainly doing that. We're also doing, we, we sort of, in the broader picture of things, we're looking at the disease influence, for instance, and population dynamics, because we have to know that. If we're trying, if we're going to be determining whether or not there's a subpopulation of wood frogs in an area or not, if it's been taken out by disease, for instance, we need to know that. So yeah, we're doing that, we're doing the, the whole, full suite of things from trying to, to figure out wood frog population dynamics in that, in that whole region. And have you been talking at all to people at ABMI in terms of their wetland monitoring? We have been, okay. yep, we have been. And you know, and I think one of the things that we'll hear talk about the acoustic recording units, right, and they might be very useful on a, on a wider regional scale.